But needless to say, I'm not going to say that computational design is a waste of time. In fact, it's a fantastic tool, um, which we use as well, but it's very much a tool that must be used to augment a traditional design process in order to come up with the best possible results. And I'm going to present a few projects which will hopefully uh, demonstrate that. Uh, for those who don't know me, I've got 25 years' experience designing bespoke and complex structures. I set up Structure Mode in 2017 with a view to making architecture and design better through a collaborative and innovative use of structural engineering, working uh, together with the designers. Uh, of course, parametric and BIM modeling. Uh, we do in-house research. I'll show you a few things. Uh, I'm also a sculptor, uh, which has influenced the, the way that we practice at Structure Mode. So this is the first project I want to show you. And uh, also provocatively at the top there, I'm saying it's the first true tensegrity structure. Uh, I mean a true tensegrity for a structural purpose as opposed to a sculpture or something which is not quite tensegrity because of its boundary conditions, relying on various supports or other, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's a presentation in, in there in itself. Um, and so this is the pavilion that we designed and built. Uh, and so we started off with a concept. There was no architect or, or designer on this project. We were given the luxurious brief to come up with a pavilion ourselves for the Vision London conference. And uh, we came up with this concept in the top left, a sketch up uh, or something, uh, a dead end uh, design tool. Uh, <laughs> And so we thought, well, hey, we, where are we going to do this? So um, we turned to Grasshopper and Rhino, um, and we developed a parametric model using our knowledge of what constitutes a tensegrity element, uh, and we connected them together into a string, uh, and we had parameters for all of the different uh, uh, aspects of that model so we can quickly change the geometry of this, even the number of arches, the number of tensegrities, the, the diameter of the tensegrity elements themselves, et cetera, et cetera. So we can iterate, quickly iterate, and generate new models for analysis purposes because we had no idea how big this needed to be to perform the function, the function being to support the tensile fabric canopy, which isn't supported by any guy ropes. It's simply supported by the tensegrity ring. So that's the structural function. Uh, and so the, the, the Grasshopper and Rhino uh, script really facilitated the, the development of these models within a reasonable time frame uh, that we could then analyze. We then could not just rely on that. Our parametric model couldn't really prove to us that it was working, uh, so we had to test it. Um, we had no, uh, no historical experience or, or even anyone else's projects really to rely upon, so we, we just built a part of one of the arches of, uh, uh, and transported it back to the office and, and hung a massive weight off it. Um, my original idea in this test was simply to just see how much it deflected and, and see if it would collapse uh, to somehow cross-check our model. Uh, at least it, we would know it was safe, whether or not it reflected reality. But we noticed that when we plucked the strings, it became a bit like a guitar uh, and I'm not sure if this video is going to work. Oh, where's the mouse? Oh, there it is. Can you hear that? Oh, it's God. <laughs> uh, next. Okay. Anyway, you heard the string, did you? Just about. <laughs> so uh, with the iPhone, we could um, determine the harmonic of that note for each string and determine the first harmonic of that note, which could then be used to determine the exact force in each cable and directly cross-check our analysis model, which uh, proved to us that it was uh, accurate. Um, but then we had to th think about how this thing would be put together, how it would be efficient to erect it and take it down again in a reasonable period of time. So we just got our, our pencil and paper out and thought about how, how we could do that. And so we got this bobbin idea where you can take it apart and we've got all the cables on a shackle that it can go on, et cetera. But that, of course, develops offsets on all of the cables. So how on earth are you going to work out how long your cables are? And seeing as these cables are pre-stressed, you have to have exactly the right cable. Otherwise, it's not going to have the right pre-stress because the pre-stress is constructed by uh, the length of the cable. So it's going to be totally 
uh, different to your analysis model. So we turned back to parametric modeling. Um, we uh, had our uh, grasshopper model from the uh, Rhino script, and we entered all of these offsets. This is the original model with no offsets on the nodes. Uh, we introduced all of the offsets on the end of each of the struts, and so then directly could uh, get our output of the cable and uh, strut lengths. We, we went a bit overboard on the render here, uh, but uh, we thought we'd make it look nice for the presentation. I hope you like that. <laughs> and we had to make it ourselves, uh, so we got down to the workshop, and we made all the struts and cables ourselves, and Miver Engineering, must credit, milled the ends, gave us a good price, and Weber Industries did the hex bases. That's Gavin on the left. And base structures did the tensile fabric for a good price too. Uh, and that's it. We envision London. The whole thing, believe it or not, is in that little trolley there. Uh, very compact. Those are the cables in the plastic box. And the fabric is wrapped up uh, on the top there. And that's me hanging off one of the arches as a load test. And we did it at uh, Westminster University as a workshop. Uh, which is another time-lapse video. It takes four hours to erect it and two hours to take it down again. And we got to do a little tensegrity workshop with the students as well. So you can do most of it all on the ground. Cables come as a, a network and you simply put the struts in. Uh, and once you've lifted it up, you tighten the turnbuckles and it becomes rigid. is sitting in my garage. If anyone knows uh, anything <laughs> I can do with it, let me know. <laughs> there goes the fabric. You can see we're losing the light there, as usual. Great. Um, so I, I then presented a, a paper at the uh, IASS conference last summer, which was very cool to get over to MIT and do that. Um, um, another project which we've used um, computational design on is for a health center uh, in Sachibundu in Zambia uh, where we discovered they had a hydroform machine for making cement-stabilized earth bricks and uh, we designed an 80 mil thick arch using these bricks uh, that spans 8 meters which uh, it's a span to depth ratio twice that of an eggshell, which is pretty good considering it's made of mud. And um, that's a render. Uh, this is our uh, parametric ish grasshopper model. We wrote our own little component in the bottom right there, which is uh, using Python script to do an elastic center method uh, tool because uh, even GSA can't do compression only structures. Correct me if I'm wrong, Peter. <laughs> okay, I've got to call you after this, okay? <laughs> um, so anyway, we did that and it's great. Um, and so we built it. Uh, that's the hydroform machine in the bottom left. That's the construction team, volunteers and local people and uh, experts, um, some skilled laborers. Um, and that's that. And we also did another project um, uh, I was just really interested in fabric formwork and wanted to see if we could do anything to get some fabric formwork into our projects. And so I had a, a student with us over summer and we decided to do some testing on concrete poured inside fabric. So we got a, uh, some fabric from a manufacturer who uh, sell their fabric to cast concrete underwater. Uh, and, uh, uh, we, we, we made a sausage of it in my garage and poured concrete inside and measured how much it stretched. There's the water coming out. It's a nice finish we got on the left. Uh, and from that test, we were able to determine how much it stretched. And uh, therefore, we could work out its elastic modulus in the two directions and its Poisson's ratio, which we could enter into the computer and do some fabric form finding again using GSA. And uh, we emulated the test, so I felt confident that We'd got the properties, and so we uh, introduced it to a project we were doing in Cambodia to build a school. And so we used uh, a little 
parametric model to quickly develop our meshes. So it can be used just to, well, do anything really. So we, uh, we made the meshes for these fabric uh, beams and columns uh, so that we could uh, quickly adjust the mesh and change the starting position to, to control the finishing geometry of the beams. And being that it was fabric formed concrete, there wasn't a lot of guidance out there on how to do it. Uh, and certainly the people who were going to be building it had never had seen it before. So we did a really simple step-by-step -step guide uh, thinking our way through every step of the process so that it, it could be constructed without a hitch on site. And this is it uh, under construction. Uh, we had uh, the fabric formwork was manufactured locally to our patterns. Um, and we used uh, small twigs uh, from low-lying branches from trees uh, because there was no sustainable timber. This was the main reason why we wanted to use fabric formworks. There's no sustainably sourceable timber in Cambodia for the project, so it was a natural bedfellow from that point of view. And the, the timber that we did use was just um, small branches that were, were terrifyingly skinny um, to avoid, avoid the use of um, tropical hardwoods. And this is the construction photo, and if there's anyone health and safety, please close your eyes. <laughs> uh, I was not on site. Uh, to control the goings on, but I just I can't help myself but put this picture. It's <coughs> nice, and that's the final result. Again, I did a paper the same last summer as well uh, on on that project at IASS, which was a lot of fun. And Philippe Bloch is doing some amazing things with fabric formed concrete. Uh, he's <coughs> king of parametric modeling and stuff like that as well. Um, so he's using cable nets here to hold fabric uh, over much longer spans than the fabric could achieve, onto which he's laying mesh reinforcement and uh, then spraying it. Uh, once the concrete is cured, he's removing the cable net and the fabric to leave the shell of concrete, which uh, he's calling the Hilo Pavilion, which is a concept um, design that he's hoping to uh, build in some nice Caribbean island, I think, for some client or other. Um, we don't get to do nice projects like that as nice. Uh, so this is a cardboard uh, structure which we um, uh, were interested to see what we could use with cardboard, uh, what kind of structures we could develop. We, we did have an idea of, of building a um, disaster relief shelter, uh, and this is a one-fifth scale model of that. So how did we get there? We, we made a grasshopper model of this, which uh, has these input parameters uh, and generates the three-dimensional barrel vault. Um, and it also gives us the template, which uh, is necessary to make each of the trays that goes in to make this vault. So we get the two things. Uh, and we knew the sheet size that the cardboard manufacturer could deal with. That's the white square. So this uh, is a, an unmanufacturable version of the, the structure. So we adjust the number of boxes in one arc uh, to make it 20 rather than 16. Uh, and now the, uh, the tray fits within the size. And this is what it is. And so we can then check this uh, in our analysis uh, software to see if the ribs are deep enough uh, so just uh, simplifying uh, that check process and developing a geometry that we know is constructible. Uh, so it's but also, you know, these, these things come out of the uh, initial idea, and so it's not, it's not driven by the computational design. Each of these projects are, 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 are a collaboration between ideas and thought, and then, and then it's facilitating the, the design process. So a manufacturer very kindly made some trays for us that we made into a box and hung some more weights off it. This is the other end of our office, by the way. We're getting a nice tour of the office gradually. Um, this is a geodesic dome which uh, we built and uh, the, the didn't use parametric modeling for the geodesic structure, but uh, the client came back to us and said, well, I'd uh, like a more interesting fabric. The original one that they got was quite cheap and just flapped around as a piece of fabric draped on a a dome, a dome being a synclastic structure such that when wind blows, it's going to flap in both directions. Uh, the only way to turn a dome into an anticlastic geometry, which is something which will not flap when the wind blows, is to stick a load of conics on it. 
which fitted perfectly with our geodesic form because we had these holes in the plates, coincidentally. Uh, so we shoved a rod through, ish through the holes uh, to create these uh, push-ups, uh, which we then analyzed using uh, form-finding fabric uh, software. So kind of computational design, isn't it? <laughs> That's the, the dome. And then uh, those in uh, Dulwich last summer might have seen the pavilion. Uh, it's, uh, this is actually our 10-year anniversary party where it rained all day. Uh, but it was a really nice demonstration that it was waterproof. Uh, and our, 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 we had a great party, actually, because everyone just huddled uh, in underneath the, the, the um, roof and, and spoke to one another, as opposed to all the other parties I was there last summer. Everyone was sitting on these tables ignoring one another. So it was kind of nice in the end. Um, and we still had a good turnout, I was relieved. Um, so we didn't use parametric design or computation modeling at all for this. It, <laughs> this is uh, the tool that we use to design the structure. It was a physical model. We, uh, we just thought about how the timber might go together. And so, you know, don't think that computational design is the be all and end all. You can, you can do some really cool things uh, with uh, a few bits of balsa wood. Uh, and just thinking about the engineering concept, so we got this uh, five and a half meter high, 50 mil thick wall panel, uh, and that, that only works in one direction. And how does that work? It's not rocket science. You've got cross brace uh, within that panel, which provides stability in only one direction, so that when that is married up with the panel in the other direction, as you can see here. Uh, so it's just a, a nice, simple, it's like a, a structural model you might see uh, in, a, in a university exam paper. What's the minimum structure you can put in uh, to make something stand up? But that's also still really slender. But of course, avoid bending and keep everything in tension or compression. Um, so that's, that I thought was quite a nice little counterpoint to all of this. Uh, of course, some nice detailing goes a long way. Uh, and finally, another curveball in the computational design uh, thing is this sculpture, wh which uh, I was approached by Julian Wilde to uh, develop this. Uh, he wanted this very irregular system of uh, blocks uh, to form this cluster. The idea is it's at Oxford University between two uh, faculty buildings, which they're building the big data institute to try and sort of crack new things to do with the human genome, working from both medical science and, and uh, physics or biosciences or something. So they're, they're kind of like these two fields coming together and they're sort of breaking apart and meeting and new things are coming out of the, the, the different uh, mindsets. So this is, of course, what's encapsulated by the sculpture. How the heck are you going to design this for the first uh, you know, uh, student protest where they're jumping on top of this thing going, ah, uh, and you know, that mustn't collapse. Uh, and it, maybe there's a lot of ice and snow and you've got like a ton of ice hanging on this thing. Uh, so quite heavy loads potentially could, could uh, capture in, in all those little crevices. Uh, so we're also working with a sculptor who has no idea about computational design or modeling. So how do we uh, marry up these two ways of working? Um, so I had the idea of, well, why don't you cut up a load of rigid insulation into blocks, which are like the things that you want to uh, weld together. And we'll come down to your workshop one day and we'll, we'll put them together together so that we are happy that we're getting all of the connections. There's like a good weld here, and that we, we did some calcs beforehand to work out what the minimum section we would need at any given location. Uh, and so we just uh, glued all the glue gun and just glued all of the blocks together. So it was like a really efficient workflow that avoided a whole ton of design, uh, and it's still standing up, so that's good. There it is. Um, so thank you, that's all I wanted to do. I uh, hope you enjoyed the projects and it gave you a, a flavor of uh, you know, just thinking a bit out of the box and using computational design to augment your workflow. <laughs>